Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to a incredibly interesting seminar on the post-liberal in the Pacific, perspectives of the future and in, of the international order. And we have some marvelous speakers, and I'll introduce them in, 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 a, in a second. Um, I think this seminar uh, is, unfortunately, of growing importance. What we've seen is a authoritarianism growing internationally. We've seen uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, or the second Russian invasion of Ukraine. We've seen China taking a greater uh, role in internationally. We see cooperation between um, North Korea and Russia, for example as one example, but also between other authoritarian states. And um, increasingly, I would say, the, the liberal free order has been challenged. And so we take this time, and this is a second seminar we're doing, um, to try to reflect on what we can do to actually improve uh, the situation and how we can make things more effective to defend liberal values and the international order. But uh, first of all, um, this is a joint event between Sejong Institute and uh, Institute for Security and Development Policy, ISDP. And I would like to welcome President Lee to just to say a few welcoming remarks as well. So President Lee, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, uh, Nicholas. Uh, welcome to uh, Sejong ISDP webinar. Uh, uh, as Nicholas mentioned, the, the topic of this webinar is quite interesting. Uh, we will discuss uh, what is the future uh, international order. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, the, the, the so-called liberal international order that we used to know uh, since the Second World War II, Second World War, is changing to something else <laughs> we don't know yet. And of course, there are many things that, uh, that will shape the future of international order. Uh, uh, many factors like a uh, U.S.-China uh, strategic competition and uh, longer-term uh, 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 competition and confrontation between uh, global West and global East. So we don't know uh, how this uh, internet order will unfold in the future. And uh, personally, I hope that uh, we can uh, fix or uh, improve a liberal international order if there is any problem. But it depends uh, how uh, the whole world can work together uh, uh, to cope this uh, changing situation. So uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for joining today's webinar. And I hope that uh, we can have a very interesting discussion to foresee what would happen in the international order in the coming years. Thank you for joining us. Nicholas, back to you. Yeah, thank you, President Lee. Um, well, for, I'll, I'll introduce all three speakers now, and then um, I would just call on you to do your presentations. Uh, first out, we're going to have uh, Gunnar Hjortmark, uh, who has uh, had several decades of experience working in democratic institutions in Sweden and the EU. He's the current chairperson of the Stockholm Free World Forum, Privad. Uh, he's been a former uh, member of the uh, European Parliament, the Swedish Parliament. Um, I would like to really uh, mention that uh, Gunn has been very much the person behind uh, all the what we, the Monday sort of 12 o'clock meetings in defense of Ukraine. Uh, this is one of the persons that's been standing up to democratic institutions and democracy here in Sweden. So it's, it's a fantastic pleasure to have Gunnar here. A second one up is Dr. Songmon Lee, research fellow at Sejong Institute, previous deputy director of the Korea On Point and a researcher at the ASAN Institute for Policy Studies, Center for Foreign Affairs and Security, um, a PhD in international politics, University of Bath. Um, it's also been a, one of our contact points uh, for this collaboration, and we're extremely grateful to, to have him here. And then uh, last, and definitely definitely not least, Barbara Kratuk. Uh, she's Assistant Professor at Faculty of Political Science and International Studies, University of Warsaw, and an Associate Research Fellow here at ISDP. Uh, she has a PhD in International Relations and Far East Studies at the University of Warsaw. 
Um, and it's uh, a fantastic contribution. And uh, one of the, I think, uh, persons that have an insight in a country that really has been on the battle line when it comes to democracy and authoritarianism, uh, not least maybe domestically. Uh, so it's a fantastic opportunity to have Barbara. But with that, uh, I'm going to let all three have 15 minutes each, and then we can open up for commentary and discussions from our colleagues from ISDP and Sia John. And then we also open up for discussions and questions from the audience. For the audience, uh, I write your questions in a Q&A, Q &A, and I will try to ask as many as possible of these questions. So with that, uh, Gunnar, uh, I would like love you to start, if that's possible. That is possible. So, Excellent. The, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. And, and thanks to the ISDP and the Sejong Institute for not only the possibility to present some reflections on, on this matter, on the future of the liberal order in the Indo-Pacific, but also by that forcing me to think a little bit more about it from, from Swedish and European perspective. Um, and first of all, I would like to make one reflection or other statement, and that is uh, and, and I think it was mentioned before, defending the liberal order in the Indo-Pacific can't be decoupled from defending the liberal global order. Uh, and I think this is in some way obvious, but still I think it is worth while to underline because a lot of people would like to forget that or to, to look away from that fact. Uh, the, the, this is a highly European interest. Um, what we can achieve in the Indo-Pacific area now, in order to strengthen the liber liberal order, will be crucial for the development of the global economy and the international order of our time. In a, it's in reality, uh, and this is when I'm entering some of the things that might be obvious in some way, but we still doesn't reflect on it enough, but it, it was a very long time since regional conflicts were regional. Uh, the globalization as such is globalizing not only business, trade and prosperity, news and information, it does also globalize conflicts. And from a principal point, this is a result of an extremely successful globalization that has defeated poverty in region after region, but also secured new chains of supply. And whenever one chain is closed down, we can see that new ones are appearing in a new form. And then there is still another rational closely linked to this. And that is the more digital, the less territorial. Digitalization shrinks distances and connects everything. And we all know that. That's nothing new. But uh, in some way, we need to reconcile and make the conclusions much more about it. Uh, and this fact that distances are shrinking or in some way becoming irrelevant is becoming more important in a world economy where services are becoming the most valuable part of exports and imports. Yeah, the transport of goods are one thing, but the transports of services in IT technology and whatever it is, is another thing. And that means that the difference between here and there gradually becomes irrelevant. Uh, there was a, in, in Swedish television there was for some years uh, ago Niklas might remember uh, a children's program saying that here is where you are there is where you're not are uh, this is in some way not any longer true because we are everywhere here is there and there is here in, in a very connected world China is for example not as far away from Sweden as it once was. China is in Sweden. Uh, the fact is that our biggest car industry is owned by Chinese interest. Uh, so China is in Sweden as well as in Europe, but Sweden and Europe are in China as well, as a consequence of investments and trade that are not depending on distance. And the same applies to all of our countries in, in different ways. We are all over the place, so to say, all of us. And when China in this way is in Europe, it's not only the economic dimensions we talk about, 
not only production factors we can count on, it's also the political aims and views of the Chinese communist regime that is present in our democracies, as well as in the Indo-Pacific region. And I think this is so important to be aware of because a lot of people have seen the Chinese presence as only an economical one, only of an advantage for business life, but it do have implications for a lot of other things because the logics of dictatorships are the same in all directions and with all the means in foreign policy as well as domestically. The difference is that in foreign policy, even dictatorships need to think twice because of conflicting powers and forces out of their control. That is not the case domestically for them. But the logic is still the same. That's why they want to take control as we can see in Russia, in Ukraine, or we can see how China is acting versus um, Taiwan or the Southeast, Southeast, Southeast Chinese Sea and other areas. And once again, they are much closer than we tend to believe. And that's why we need to be firm. The fact that what happens in the Indo-Pacific region has a global impact doesn't, on the other hand, mean that the confrontations there are less specific for the region or less of a challenge for the countries involved, rather the other way around. Uh, what happens there, what policies are implemented there in the Indo-Pacific region, and the military balance there will have an enormous impact on us all. And, and I, I, I can just highlight some examples that we all know. The pandemic caused not only global health challenge, the consequences in the Indo-Pacific region and in China had obvious effects on the global economy, the threat against Taiwan and the conflict that North Korea is causing has enormous implications for the respect of the international order, but also, for example, for the supply of semiconductors and chips. The Chinese claims on territories in the Southeast Sea is lowering the threshold for other regimes to claim territories from other countries. Uh, in that way, you can see Russia's war in Ukraine as an example for China, and hopefully the failure is a warning. While, as we can see today, the Venezuelan claims on territories in Guyana is a part of the same pattern, to use force in order to get what you want. So what happens in the Indo-Pacific, in difference to Las Vegas, doesn't stay there. Still, what can and should happen there is up to the policies from those close by and from the commitment of all of us. So the challenge is, as I see it, how to relate to dictatorships in an open world economy without giving them an upper hand against open societies and democracies. Uh, the answer is very simple, in my mind. The free world needs to act and stand together in a way that forces regimes like China to relate to us, not that we relate to them. First of all, we need to understand that free trade in its real meaning can be free only between free societies and free economies. Trade with state-controlled economies always needs to be granted by the regimes. It will always be dependent on the minds and the aims of the regime. This is complicated by the fact that in the other direction, di di direction dictator-controlled economies are making use of open economies as much as possible in order to utilize them for their own aims as much as possible. It's very asymmetric. And this is why we, together and united, need to be firm on mutual recognition and mutual access, as well as without compromise require, require respect for the international rule of law. Second, when dealing with dictatorships and state-controlled economies, we need to understand that they are different to ours. I don't think that is a problem in in, in your in the Indo-Pacific region today, but in Europe, it still is important to underline. Dictators will always be, by definition, be the enemies to democracy. That is the basic idea. They might be rivals in an economical sense, but they will always be more or less hostile to the freedom and rule of law that are defining our societies. And we need to take height for this. Third, we shall, on the other hand, not try to decouple their economies from the global economy. 
and from our economies, as long as they are not in war with us. It's much better if we can make use of them and if they can make use of us. It's an advantage for us if they can be dependent on our economy, but also influenced by the freedoms of the global economy, as long as we are containing their wish to weaponize trade. That includes strategic policies, safeguarding strategic knowledge, and to hinder investments whether when those can be a threat to our security. Uh, and we shall never hesitate about that they never would hesitate undermining our security if they can and are allowed to do so. Fourth, we shall have a self-confidence in the democracy of ours. We need to form and uphold the rules of the global economy and we need to stand together when doing so. Knowing that democracies in the long run are always the better societies. With free thinking, competition, innovation, entrepreneurship, joy of life and freedom to develop the new things shouldn't make us naive and open for hostilities that could undermine our security. We need to scrutinize investments that are directed at sensitive infrastructure and strategic knowledge, not only when it's about dual juice, but also of strategic competitiveness defining what can be threats to our societies and by that what is not is needed if we are to be open for investments and companies coming from these regimes. Five, fifth, we shall not allow regimes like China to attack one country <clears throat> with weaponized trade or blockade without alerting all of us others. We shall act united so they, China and others, need to relate to our rules and standards, not that single countries in the free world need to relate the, to their arbitrary use of economic power. We shall act in a way so that they need to follow our rules, not that some of us shall be forced to obey to their threats. Six, economies and companies need to think along the principles of market economy. The magic of the market economy is its resilience and plurality. Never be dependent on monopolies and oligarchs, always to depend on competition, rely on diversity in private ownership. Remember that free trade is between free companies and free, company, free economies. Seven, as market economies and democracies are superior to state regimes and business run by dictators, we will be the winners if we stand firm in what we are and together with those who are like us. A key reflection in this is that the countries of the free world needs to act as the free world. Then the autocratic regimes will be forced to relate to us because we are economically much, much stronger and we need to be able to exercise this strength. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Gunnar. Always enlightening to listen to you. Uh, someone, Lee, you would like to start with your presentation. I think you have a PowerPoint as well. So let's see if we can get it up. Ah, perfect. See my slides, okay. Yeah, you see your slides. Could you, if you put it on full screen, uh, it would be fantastic. Uh can I, can I use it as it is? Because I, I could just see the next slide. In, in the okay, space. sure. All Go right. ahead. Okay. Um, thank you very much for organizing this meaningful event. And my name is Someone Lee. I'm working at Daejeon Institute as a research fellow. I feel grateful and honored to for the chance to present on timely and important topic. As I conducted relevant research, recently on today's subject, and I'd like to share some of my findings through this presentation. Um, my research is originally divided into two parts, and in the first part, I provide a brief overview of current trends of forming multilateral coalitions among like-minded democratic countries, specifically in, in the region of Indo-Pacific. But and I also examined the strategy strategic terms such as rules-based international order and like-mindedness that enable such solidarities among fragmented blocks in the international relations from a theoretical perspective. However, due to the time that I've been given for 15 minutes, 
Um, I will focus on solely on the research finding from the second part of my research, which is based on a survey. Um, so my presentation is entitled like um, this on the slides, like-minded and crisis management. I'm looking at the um, South Korea and Europe's security cooperation and its implications and challenges, especially in, in three different domains. So <clears throat> my um, key rationale of the research is that I think world is becoming increasingly fragmented and conflict of visions centered on ideology and order is recognized as a major axis that determines the reshaping current international order and the inclusive rules-based world order is under severe strain and threatens to regress into a fragmented block order uh, with middle powers such as Korea and Europe, the global south nearly in the limelight. Um, but um, despite the shared goals and there are different differing in interpretations of what constitutes the rules-based order among countries and experts potentially causing frictions in international relations. This is the basic key uh, rationale of my research. And the purpose of research is uh, for two different <clears throat> ways. Um, first one is analysis of the key strategic concepts and their developments. I want to examine concepts uh, reviewing the object and functions of a key terms such as rules-based international order and like-mindedness and discussing conceptual and functional weaknesses from critical perspective. And we like to evaluate the South Korea, Europe's role and limitations in crisis management as a rules-based like-minded partners. And I want to identify the areas and approaches of corporations. So, I think this kind of research is needed uh, because I personally think the Korea-Europe's relations is evolving. So they both recognize as a like-minded partners on global stage and both are middle powers with a high strategic understanding and they became um, regional partners sharing practical benefits in, in the Indo-Pacific region. So sharing experiences and know-how and dispute resolution and crisis management and securing practical space for cooperation are essential for both sides, I think. And so my research is basically based on a survey and was, which is conducted targeting 30 European experts from four different countries. And each survey participants was asked to complete a series of questions organized under three outlined themes, as you can see on the slides. The first one is perception of the concept of rules-based international order and like-mindedness. And the second one is multilateral cooperation among like-minded countries and crisis management. And the final one is Europe and South Korea's cooperation as like-minded partners in crisis management. And I utilize the contents analysis and tax mining and sentiment analysis uh, techniques has been employed uh, in my research. So, um, firstly, um, uh, <clears throat> the research <clears throat> sets the Europeans' perception of the concept of rules-based international order, and European experts generally agree on key elements that constitutes a rules-based order and like-mindedness. And most experts believe that respecting international law is a, um, essential for rules-based order. Um, the role of the multilateral system centers around the United Nations and international organizations is recognized as the foundation of rules-based international order. Also, emphasis is placed on diplomacy, negotiation, and peaceful dispute resolution through multilateral organizations, as well as their role in promoting stability, cooperation, and preventing unilateral actions from authoritarian countries. And rules-based order is seen as a broad concept, just encompassing norms, regulations, and value guidelines, extending beyond the, like a legal rules 
and core elements in, include the defense of liberal principles, such as democracy, the rule of law, uh, universal human rights, and free trade and open markets. And in sum, the respondent's perspective on the rules-based international order vary, with some emphasizing its legal functions and others viewing it as a shared vision of global governance. And when you see on the right side on the slides, uh, experts perceive like-mindedness as a connection between countries unified, united by the shared visions, values, interests, particularly in political economic liberalism, democracy, and respect for human rights. These like-minded countries are identified by their common values, positions, and perceptions of crisis, and they exhibit and solidarities in addressing specific conflict and challenges. The notably, um, there is a conceptual connection between rules-based international order and like-mindedness, as you can see, and indicating that coalitions among countries with similar positions, so-called like-minded partners, particularly democratic ones, is strengthening in parallel with the evolving concept of the rules-based international order. Um, this is an infographic showing the analysis of the keywords core currency network based on the answer from European experts on the concept of rules-based order and like-mindedness. Uh, but I will skip this slide because I need to spend some time to explain this. So, but, um, <clears throat> The next one is experts have varied responses to the question on whether the concept of rules-based order possess conceptual universality that could be accepted or embraced by majority of the region in the world. Specifically, 36% of respondents believe that the idea of rules-based order lacks conceptual universality, but 56% uh, of respondents acknowledge that a certain degree of universality in the concept, but notice that its scopes and applicability were somewhat limited. Conceptual universality was perceived to be relatively high among like-minded democratic countries sharing democratic values. But in contrast, only 8% of respondents states that the current rules-based order has a clearly defined concept that could be universally applied globally. So <clears throat> regarding the ultimate objectives and roles of forming coalitions among like-minded countries, European, expect, uh, European expert expects that uh, international peace and stabilities and preservations and protection of rules-based international law uh, order and dissemination of shared values and norms and addressing global challenges, deterrence and balances, strengthening international organizations, um, preventing and pro providing support in case of violations of sovereignty, um, promoting economic interdependence and prosperities. Um, these are the objectives. Um, as for the um, expected roles, you can see on the screen. I, I will not follow the one by one. Um, as for the key challenges in the uh, current the formed mini lateral corporations among like-minded countries, especially in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, <clears throat> fluidity of coalitions and corporations and pressures from authoritarian major powers and conflict in national interest in among like-minded countries and in insufficient determinations and commitment to um, safeguarding democracy, lack of a clear clarity regarding deterrence methods and their effects, uh, exclusive form of unity, and emissary in power dynamics has been pointed out as a key challenges. And the, on your right side, I state the detailed contents in, in each columns. Um, so for example, when you talk about the fluidity of coalitions and corporations and the respondents states that it's been and it's viewed that the unstructured platforms or corporations and there's a disjointed and fragmented multilateral and minilateral corporations, corporation platforms. And so it leads a diminished effectiveness resulting from short leaves and overlapping cooperative initiatives in the region. 
So according to survey results, the majority of um, respondents agree that the growing coalitions among like-minded countries currently have an exclusive nature. The concept primarily evolved around the dynamics of global East and West divided. Um, however, there are criticism that it is excluding certain regions from concept by not sufficiently reflecting the perspective of global South, which include Asia, like most of Asia in Africa and South America. Um, the graph shows the result of sentiment analysis known as a VEDA, which categorize and assess the survey respondents' sentiments and attitudes towards the issue. Uh, classifying them into positive, negative, and neutral criteria. When analyzing the responses to descriptive questions regarding the effectiveness of unilateral coalitions among like-minded countries in crisis management, a range of attitudes and opinions among experts can be noticed. Um, in general, European experts seem to believe that unilateral coalitions among like-minded countries are making a positive contribution to conflict prevention and crisis management tool, or are expected to do so in the future. So the analysis results predominantly fall within the neutral to positive range, as you can see on the slides. So respondents have mixed expectations and concerns regarding the growing trend of unilateral collisions among long-minded countries, while there is a hope for improved global security and regional stability due to the flexibility and efficiency of these coalitions. There is also a concern that their focus on efficiency might exasperate a, like a factionalism within to the, a, for the tensions and conflicts. Um, furthermore, experts are both hopeful and worries about how these informal unilateral coalitions interact with the traditional multilateral institutions. There is a shared perception that these coalitions should aim for cooperative relationship that complement rather than undermine the legitimacy of existing multilateral organizations. So <clears throat> the survey participants were asked about the implications of cooperation between Korea and Europe, as well as their expected roles from South Korea in three distinct domains, namely Ukraine, the Indo-Pacific region, and North Korea. And in Europe, <clears throat> the expert anticipates that Korea taking a more active role in providing diplomatic, economic, humanitarian, and potentially military support to Ukraine in ongoing conflicts. And it is expected to continue the cooperation and solidarity from Korea in safeguarding territorial integrity and, and upholding rules-based international order, rooted in shared values and norms. And the Indo-Pacific region, um, experts acknowledge that the Europe's geographical distance and limited military capabilities constraints its leadership role in potential security crisis in the region. Therefore, they emphasize the importance of cooperating with the major regional powers like US and Australia and Japan and Korea. And <clears throat> regarding the crisis management, the majority of respondents favor diplomatic initiative over military intervention in disputes where they have no or indirect interest. Um, cooperation in non-military security areas, such as disaster relief and climate change has been seen as a practical goals and ensuring freedom of navigation has been stressed. Uh, with the naval policies and maritime security being recognized as, as a area, so most feasible and successful corporations. And both Europe and Korea value partnership with the ASEAN um, countries for regional stability and prosperity. Um, in the domain of North Korea, European experts acknowledge that Europe's limited direct intervention capability and the North Korean nuclear issue under current circumstances and their approaches um, <clears throat> stress the protection of non-profilar <clears throat> proliferations norms and emphasize the need for strong sanctions to achieve denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. 
There's a willingness to closely cooperate with the South Korea in deterring North Korean military provocations, including military cooperation against the conventional cyber and nuclear threats. And areas of military cooperation for crisis management uh, include maritime security, cyber security, arms control, and disarms control, and cooperation in monitoring and exchanging information on military activities and ship movements involving North Korea's friendly countries. But at the same time, when the sanction on North Korea East, Europe um, shows their willingness to restart its humanitarian aid efforts, and they can use the network um, they built with the governments and private organization over time. Furthermore, some experts uh, propose like that if necessary, Europe and North Korea can have discussions often refers to a 1.5 track dialogue covering topics like environment, culture, economy, and educations. And, and it is expected this discussion could help reduce the problem in the region. Um, when you see these slides, this is interesting. Um, respondents recognize the necessity of a cooperation between Korea and Europe across the whole these, like I suggested, the distinct, three distinctive conflict areas, but it's apparent the approach varies somewhat depending on the nature of each dispute. For, for instance, Europe experts highlight the importance of a dialogue as Europe's expected role in the escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula, but this same approach is not, not stressed as a Korea's expected role in Russia-Ukraine conflict. Likewise, Europe, um, <clears throat> European experts stress the diplomatic solutions for issues in Korean Peninsula and in the Pacific region, diplomatic approaches receive relatively less emphasis when it comes to uh, Ukraine conflict. Furthermore, while Europe's approach, Europe's approach to the Indo-Pacific and ongoing Ukraine conflict with a focus on upholding the rules-based international order, there's a relatively less emphasis on the application of this rule-based international order when addressing North Korean issues. So um, this is what I prepared and I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I will let uh, Barbara jump in immediately and then we can take it from uh, from there. Of course. Thank you so much once again for, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here with such uh, distinguished uh, people, distinguished scholars. Um, I would like to start from a kind of a more theoretical nexus of state values, interests and power. Because if we want to talk about cooperation and maintaining the rule-based order, we have to start with the cooperation. And cooperation between democratic and non-democratic states have been happening for has been happening for a very, very long time. What's more also I think very important and very typical for Indo-Pacific is that the largest number or the most intensive cooperation happens between mid-range powers what, or what we could call middle powers, it's different important regional actors, but not states that actually dominate the region, because these are the ones that actually have the biggest stake in this game, in maintaining this rule-based order, in maintaining uh, the, or the rules that actually helped both democratic and non-democratic states thrive. If we look at the Indo-Pacific, states uh, such as um, Thailand for a while, which for years uh, experienced a military coup and military regime, or Vietnam, which has been an authoritarian regime for very, very many years, they have both benefited hugely from this rule-based order. So in a lot of ways, these states are going to try and maintain that rule-based order because it's also in their own interests. Of course, when we consider states uh, that are much more revisionist, like Russia or China, that's not going to be the case. But there is a much, I think, greater hopeful cooperation also between both democratic and non-democratic states in the lower level because of their common interests. Um, so I think that the very important thing 
to mention is that we cannot um, divide the cooperation into cooperation with non-democratic and democratic states. Because cooperation with non-democratic states in Indo-Pacific is crucial to maintaining that, that rule-based order and to maintaining the existing distribution of power, which helps maintain that order. Um, because if we actually decided, if democratic states decided to not work with non-democratic states, what would it look like? It would, would we actually want to go back to the early periods of the Cold War? Because that's basically what we would have, a very, very distinct divisions that would actually work even more greatly against the rule-based order instead of for it. There would be, moreover, no cooperation on transnational issues, such as the one that have been mentioned by Professor Lee, like environment, for example. And of course, the values that are inherently the basis of the rule-based order would not be maintained anyway, because uh, those states that are outside of the order, outside of the cooperation with democracies, which have even less incentive to actually follow that. Uh, my another kind of my second point, I think here is that when we talk about these different national strategies of states, uh, we have to consider that these national strategies in the Indo-Pacific, be it Japan, be it United States, China, Vietnam, or Indonesia, they will always reflect the uh, interest and values of those states. And that these values will overlap, but even between democratic states, these values are not the same, as has already been shown. Uh, these values will not never be exactly the same. So there, while we can consider certain overlap for cooperation, uh, the tools that states might want to employ uh, will be different, which was again very clearly showcased by Professor Lee. So sometimes actually I would argue that the regime type is going to be less important than immediate values and the rules and tools employed by those states in the Indo-Pacific. Because if we want to take a look at the issues of South China Sea and the conflict therein, both uh, democratic and non-democratic states have been cooperating, especially within ASEAN, but not only, uh, and in wanting to maintain and establish those rules. And they have employed very similar tools. Uh, so regime here doesn't have to mean completely withdrawing from the rules-based orders. What's more, smaller states which want to, again, use that cooperation to increase their own power and to increase their own standing and also to promote their own values, of course. Japan is one such great example of a state that has been very effectively using economic tools to maintain and promote its own values, especially the free and open in the Pacific, is again a tool to maintain the rule-based order in Indo-Pacific. And a lot of states actually engage with that, including non-democratic states, states that have had very difficult uh, issues regarding human rights uh, and respect for the international law. Uh, finally, I think my, my one question here is also going to be, uh, what about the states that are democratic but are sliding towards more liberal democracy? Uh, we have had many examples of that. Poland is a great example example of a state that actually was very close to becoming a much more illiberal democracy. We've had, we've been observing a slide towards illiberal democracy in India for many years now, almost 10. And Mr. Modi is very likely to win again. We've had a really anti-liberal leader in the most, in, in, in the leader of all the democratic states in the United States. When we have had Mr. Trump in power, uh, that was an illegal leader. Um, Thailand, very similar thing. 
For a lot of years, this was uh, a military rule under Prior Chanocha, and it was largely an illiberal state. So how do we then define this cooperation uh, when, as a based on democracies, when also even democracies are not stable enough to predict the continuation of that, especially in the region? Well, we will have some very stable democracies like South Korea or Taiwan. Arguably, even Indonesia or Singapore are not actually full democracies. So in that sense, if we want to look at the rule-based orders and the values of individual states, it's going to be very difficult to really maintain the what, what we would want to be a purity of values, democratic values. So in that sense, I think it's very going to be very difficult. Morav would basically state that different values would inform the interest of the state, uh, and that these uh, in, the, uh, in turn shape state preferences and strategies. So basically, a lot of the states will shape their preferences based on their own identity, and also, of course, on their geographic position. So, but even among democratic states, those illiberal and liberal democracies, we will have a clash of values. We already experienced that and very clearly see that in a lot of places, especially glaringly, we can observe this in Indo-Pacific. But paradoxically here, in a lot of places, non some non-democratic regimes are actually helpful in maintaining or increasing some of those values like liberal trade. For Vietnam or Philippines under Mr. Duterte, uh, maintaining the open sea lines of communication was one of the most important parts of Indo-Pacific and of maintaining the rule based order. So there, I think, there will always be a certain selectiveness to how states approach this uh, because there never is really an overlap. So are we then talking about what Kissinger would say, order over justice? Um, because that, I think, is in some ways really impossible unless a state kind of imposes their own very defined values on all the states, but that also would not be very democratic and would go against the idea of liberal based order. Um, so certain expectations are already have to be managed when it comes to cooperation with non um, with non democratic states, because there will be cooperation and there is a cooperation with non democratic states that actually support the existing rule based order. Uh, but I would argue that we also have to manage expectations for cooperation with illiberal democracies, because they might actually be the world card in this equation. Uh, if we look at India, India is a very often an unreliable partner for the rest of the Quad. So in that sense, really, if we want to make sure that the alignment of democratic states ensures a rule-based order, it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to maintain. Um, and really to, to conclude these, I guess, uh, various remarks that I had and thoughts that I had on, on the rule-based order in the Pacific, I would say that we are already in a lot of ways experiencing different types of cooperation between both democratic and non-democratic states that want to support this existing order because it's very clearly in their interest and aligns with their own values. But if we look at those values from both democratic and non-democratic perspective, they can overlap and they will overlap only in certain areas. And that's normal because states, even democratic states, will have different interests. So basically uh, the pursuit of values of small groups of small states and these different mini lateral groupings will always be 
a very difficult thing to continue and very difficult thing to manage because we will also see a lot of interest going against each other, even between many laterals that contain the same states. Um, because if we want to look even at the trilaterals, as Michael Green called them, uh, we will have multiple ones in Indo-Pacific, uh, but they will be working at cross purposes. If we look at the Russia, China, Vietnam uh, triangle and US, Japan, Vietnam triangle, their interests are completely different. Their values are going to be different. And yet they are all working within the framework of the rule-based order in the Indo-Pacific. But they will be working in a completely different ways, using completely different tools, managing or supporting completely different ideas. And it's not only it's not only Vietnam. India, Russia, China is a similar triangle. India, US, Australia. So these are all going to be groupings that will have different values. So I think to, to the earlier point, I think, made both by uh, Professor uh, Hockmark and Professor Lee, if we look at this from the perspective of values and the differences in values, we will see also inherent differences within democratic states, not only between democracies and non-democracies in the Indo-Pacific. And with that, I think I would like to conclude. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. I think it's uh, starting up for an interesting discussion, and I think that we're going to be different on a number of um, uh, issues. And I think that is actually one indication of a free and liberal <laughs> and, and discussion and, uh, and the democracies that we do differ. And I don't see the challenge so much that we differ. We always do. Um, I mean, we, we just had an election in Poland where suddenly we had a President Tusk got elected and suddenly overnight, uh, oh, I wouldn't say he's soon to be elected, I guess. Um, it, the perception was that uh, Poland turned democratic, democratic again. Uh, so, but at the same time, I mean, I, I find this institutions being extremely valuable. Um, and I, I see this as a scale. I mean, we all differ. Even Sweden and Norway differ. Sweden and Denmark. Uh, very small states, very similar. Of course, we have different interests in certain things. But I also think we there are commonalities that are extremely important. But that said, I mean, there's a scale. Um, and when, you, when I work on supply chains, it's very cl clear that certain countries you trust more uh, because they have the institutions that you, you deal with, uh, that you trust. Uh, so even if we differ in interest, there are democratic institutions that protect us. So my, my argument is very much, we need to limit the supply chain. We need to shorten it, not necessarily in distance, but in number of hubs to make it more secure. And, the more critical the industries are, the more democratic or more institutionalized uh, or the more similar institutions that we have is preferable. Um, if it's just consumer goods, we can be less, we can be more, you know, tolerant in, in putting it in other industries. But this is a, this is a scale that I think is going to be always there and a very interesting to discuss. But I would just like to open up a few comments from uh, start with Vice President uh, Myon Won Lee. Do you any comments? Yes. Hi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me. Uh, my name is uh, Lee Myon Wu, uh, Vice President of the Sejong Institute. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I. I mostly, in a sense, agree with what has been said uh, today. I mean, uh, Mr. Gunnars and Dr. Sohan and uh, Dr. Barbaras. So, I mean, uh, there, uh, there are not much questions that I, uh, let's say, uh, up against. 
so I just kind of rephrase uh, shortly, and uh, I I want to raise uh, some uh, questions about what what about the topic we are talking about. Um, these days I I, I trace again uh, what uh, Japan's has been uh, said about uh, in the past week. Is there is a uh, uh, FOI, uh, free and uh, uh, open uh, in the past week. And I kind of noticed that uh, they are, especially on the Prime Minister Kishida, uh, they are kind of emphasizing the role of or the, uh, or the consider consideration um, about uh, Global South. And um, I, I took that that was quite interesting. Uh, that is say, uh, as you may know, uh, and and it is my I mean, Japan is my uh, specialty in a sense. Japanese uh, domestic politics and foreign relations is my specialty. So uh, I kind of noticed that, and um, these days, uh, Prime Minister Kishida arguing in the in the domestic uh, politics and domestic uh, economic uh, issues. He put forward the concept or a notion of a new capitalism in, in Japan, which uh, tried to combine that uh, growth orientation with a distribution uh, kind of I mean, uh, concept. So uh, <clears throat> I think uh, what I'm what I noticed interesting was that. Uh, they seem to uh, put forward this uh, kind of a country based uh, notion in the uh, uh, in the world order so i'm not quite sure it is the right phrase or not but japan or uh, or japan under uh, prime minister kishida tried to have uh, this uh, social liberal kind of a world order by emphasizing and the uh, emphasizing the on the support to the global south so just just like that uh, you know in the, the domestic uh, politics or economy uh, capitalism kind of in uh, things with uh, distribution kind of uh, i mean efforts so do you i mean so my question is i mean do you think not only to the uh, presentators, but to others also, that it, it, would, would it be possible that uh, we have this social liberal kind of a world order? I mean, I know that uh, the West has been, uh, has tried hard to uh, manage it to uh, supply that uh, ODA or overseas assistance to the uh, so-called that uh, let's say uh, poor countries and all the kind of things but and uh, in a sense uh, that has some uh, success but some may say uh, it just uh, the efforts has been in kind of in vain so that there are still many things to do uh, to towards the uh, let's say uh, poor countries or or the third world or uh, global south. So uh, that's the first question that I uh, want to raise. And uh, since we our topic is post-liberal, then what? So would this uh, social liberal, if there, there is something uh, 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 right phrase, then uh, would, would it be the, some alternative? That's the first uh, question I want to ask. And another one is that we, as uh, Dr. Sangwon has mentioned, we talk about, and uh, Dr. Barbara also mentioned that a variety of I mean concepts on what what is rule, uh, <laughs> which is I don't understand why we are raising that kind of uh, question, but. If we uh, think about those eighties, uh, was uh, from six uh, from fifties to nineties, uh, uh, so-called uh, free trade, as a rule, has been admitted so, so far. 
then why why there are some doubts about this free trade or WTO or that kind of institutions? So uh, the second uh, question is, which is a little <laughs> uh, different uh, from what just what I had just said is that is it really possible to rule out the authoritarian authoritarian uh, kind of I mean culture or uh, some uh, uh, I mean uh, doing things. Uh, for achieving uh, this rule-based uh, order uh, from those, uh, you know, uh, from those, uh, let's say, uh, global south. I mean, uh, we are kind of, I mean, we, we talk about uh, confrontation between uh, China and United States. I think there are two main uh, cleaves lines uh, in terms of a political system, uh, is democrat democracy or liberal democracy against uh, authoritarianism, and in terms of uh, economic, uh, let's say, uh, economic system or economic issues, uh, growth against, let's say, uh, distributions, it seems. But um, <clears throat> this. Uh, how, especially for the latter part of uh, economic issues, that is it a growth orientation or the distribution orientation? Uh, there could be way to combine these kind of uh, two uh, two goals, I think. So, and one of the way would be the efficiency, not the system in a sense. So there could be. Uh, I think that is why. Um, in a sense, many or some uh, global South countries do agree or to follow, in a sense, at least in the surface, to the uh, China's kind of lead or uh, arguments. So uh, that that's, in a sense, why I'm raising, uh, in a sense, this somewhat uh, similar to what uh, Dr. Barbara uh, kind of argues, there are many uh, varieties of this uh, uh, democracies or liberal democracies with different uh, cultures or norms or concepts. So uh, that's the, uh, my second uh, question. Is it really necessary or possible to rule out these uh, cultural things when we talk about a rule-based? Or is it necessary? Uh, and if we come to some, uh, let's say, conclusion or some answers, then there could be some uh, uh, ways to uh, cooperate. I think uh, so. Could come back to the first case, uh, not yeah, first question or the first uh, talk that I mentioned about uh, Japan's uh, FOIP. Uh, would there be? I mean, the the paying attention to the global south would be uh, one of the uh, ways to kind of uh, cooperate between uh, not only East and West, but uh, uh, with the East, I mean, the West and the uh, Global South, I think. Yeah, that's about. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, I'm President. Sure. Um, I'm going to open up for Gunnar Songwon, and then if Barbara has any comments on that as well, and then I'm going to go over to uh, Chung Ye uh, Hong uh, for his comments, but uh, Gunnar, you can start. You had a uh, your hand up. I see. Mm -hmm. Th th thank you very much. F first of all, I, I think that our approach shall be that we shall cooperate with uh, with everyone that we can cooperate with, but we need to know who we are, and we need to know the difference between democracies and authoritarian regimes. And we need to understand that the authoritarian regimes doesn't have the same interests as democracies. We, 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 you can say that we all have different interests in some way. As individuals, we have different interests. But that depends on what sort of level we are talking about. On the fundamental level, I think it's time that we see that democracies around the world has very much the same interest. And, and that includes, of course, what was raised just now, 
the, the democratic, uh, the, the culture so, uh, by Mr. Song, Song Wan Lee about the cultural differences. In an open world, you can have cultural differences, but you apply the same fundamental rules. And in some way, I think that um, we will always have regions, of course, by geographical necessity. Uh, but maybe we shall not define the world so much upon these regional clusters, because we are in a globalized world much more dependent on each other. I would say that the interest of South Korea and Sweden are much closer, obviously, than the interest of Sweden and and Russia, to, to make it very, very extreme, clear example. Uh, in, in reality, in the world that where the distances has become more and more irrelevant. We need to understand that we are not operating firsthand in regional clusters, but we need to see upon things as, uh, as a global cluster or a global network where, where the like-minded countries, democracies of different kind, are uniting more because that will make it easier for us to cooperate with the other regimes. Because if we know who we are and we can stand together upholding firmly the rules of international order, then we don't need to be afraid. We need to be afraid when China, for example, can block the economy of Norway and no one does anything about it, or Sweden. But if we stand together, and if I may phrase it, if we talk about the free world, not with the small letters, but with the big capital letters uh, as a unity, then it's another thing. And in some way, I'm a firm believer in the development of European Union, but, but I would like also to see a firm development of, of, of the free world countries and our unity and communality, because that will make it much more easier to open up for the autocracies and make them relate to us instead of us relating to them. Thank you. Come on. You want to... Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for raising very important questions, uh, Vice President Lee. And I have to say, you know, I support the, I, I'm fully supported the concept of rules based international. I spent many years in Europe and I'm fully aligned with the stance with the European countries. And I just wanted it to be just disorder to be sustainable for a long time. But um, in order for the rules based international order, currently emphasizing foreign policies by democrats, democratic countries, including South Korea and most of Europe, to protect universal uh, human values and realize common prosperities we pursue and gain support for, from more countries internationally, as well as to establish institutional authority and legitimacy. It is time to systemically assess and discuss ways to develop the order conceptually and functionally. So I believe discussions are required at this point to ensure the multilateral solidarities among like-minded countries and cooperation um, based on rules-based international ultimately leads to positive and practical contributions to dis dispute resolution and crisis management and regional stabilities. I just highlight the needs for detailed agreements and coordination um, to establish uh, universally accepted rules-based international order. And I think Korea and Europe can be a um, leading country to lead these discussions because it is undeniable fact that the concerns exist about the political vulnerabilities and sustainability of this order we present, especially within the changing stances of major powers and, and great power competition dynamics. So, and it is also true that the rules-based international order, as many um, other like presenters point out, is, is seen as a Western century and not inclusive of global South perspectives. And it's an undeniable. So we have to overcome this problem. So that's why we have to keep thinking about the weaknesses and, and limitations of this order. And this is why I'm um, doing this. And 
but I'm I'm fully supported to the concept. And I, if I'm allowed, so I, I just want to add the the answer the question from the floor because uh, it raises a very good question. Uh, you make it, yeah, try to make it a, a quick answer as well because we we also uh, have uh, two uh, two other commentators. But please go ahead. Uh, but then, then I'll, I'll I'll leave the other people. Yeah. To... Barbara, do you have any quick comment before I let uh, President uh, Lee in? Uh, just uh, very quickly, like I agree with most of it. I also think that rule-based order is probably the one that we all most want. What I think in that in some ways we've already transcended the basic rules. Of, of course, the war in Ukraine shows us that this is not necessarily the case, but like Dr. Lee has put it out, unfortunately, the currently existing rule-based order has way too many limitations that we really didn't fully consider for a very long time because of the domination of of the of the of the order and of the way that the the, the international system function. Uh, however, with the rise of illiberal democracies, with the rise of democratic states such as India or Mexico, we're still working closely together with Russia. Uh, I think we really have to consider uh, what are those rules and how do we apply them not only to the non-democratic states, but how, also how we apply them to democratic states and how to make sure that the, that, that order will survive a slide of democracies towards a, a liberal and illiberal democracy like with India or illiberal leaders like Mr. Trump. So I'll just stop here for now. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit more time for questions, but I tried to address very quickly some of the some of the questions from, from Vice President Lee and of course from my predecessors. Yeah. Uh, Sangyan Lee, you had a, your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, it, it's quite interesting uh, discussion. Uh, my comment is that uh, we are talking about uh, why uh, rule-based international order or liberal international order is retreating. Okay? Uh, I have thought about uh, this phenomenon. We are witnessing uh, retreat of the uh, weakening of the international rule-based international order uh, everywhere. Maybe uh, we can find some uh, reason. Uh, for example, uh, there's a problem of global leadership uh, these days. Uh, in a sense, uh, we don't have a good hegemon uh, these days. Uh, in a uh, sort of speak, it is, it's like a interregnum. Uh, one uh, monarch is stepping down, but the next one is not ready yet. Okay, U.S. global leadership is weakening, but China is uh, not ready to take over U.S. leadership as a new hegemon. So uh, that's the one reason. And also I have thought about uh, uh, politics, domestic politics everywhere. We see uh, uh, mostly in most countries, we see uh, extreme polarization of politics, politics, emotion, populism, and everything, okay? So uh, maybe we can uh, call it a democratic backsliding. Uh, um, uh, in, in, I, I remember one statistics that say that uh, more countries move away from democracy rather than moving toward the democracy. That's what's happening uh, globally uh, these days. And uh, so the, because of that, I would say uh, we need to think about what is the uh, problem and how can we uh, remedy or fix uh, this uh, sliding or weakening uh, global uh, rule-based international order. And we talked about uh, rule-based international or li liberal international order, which is based on some values. But, uh, but some panelists already indicate that value may not be universal. Okay? So usually uh, global south, many countries in the global south uh, perceive uh, US-led uh, democracy uh, spread is kind of a uh, it, it imposing uh, external values to their political system. So. It, it, simply speaking, U.S. way of e exporting democracy is, may not be very attractive or persuasive uh, to many uh, global South countries. And Chinese model of a new global order is not, not also uh, not very attractive either. So I think that's the uh, part of the problem uh, we uh, 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 face these days. 
So uh, when uh, U.S.-China uh, uh, strategic competition uh, began, and also after the uh, Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, United States and many Western countries uh, framed the current uh, uh, status as the confrontation between democracy and uh, autocracy or dictatorship. But one problem is that, uh, as you know, globally, democracy is a minority. So, and also uh, in order to solve many uh, global problems, uh, we do not have enough solution only when we talk with like-minded democratic countries. Sometimes you have to talk to non-democratic or illiberal uh, countries as well. So that, that's the uh, kind of problem. Also, I uh, would say that we need to make, make uh, create a good narrative why liberal international order is good and why rule-based international order is better than chaotic situation. So in a sense, uh, Western democracies, Western world is failing to produce good narrative to persuade a global South countries. So uh, last point is that uh, we, need, we need to think about, can we make a, some, uh, uh, can we uh, shape some uh, minimum consensus uh, that can uh, agreed upon uh, for future uh, normatively plural, plural, pluralistic or multipolar world. Uh, unless we do not have, we cannot uh, come to the, uh, this kind of uh, consensus, uh, we will continue to see very fractured uh, global order and uh, competition, confrontation everywhere. So let me stop here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We're already running one minute over, but I hope that we can run to 9.50, if that's okay. If somebody needs to leave, please do so. But uh, Professor Chung, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm very short time comment today. Yeah. Sorry about yeah, very, that, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, very, I think it's very meaningful attend this webinar because I'm China export. I many, every time Chinese Russia scholar, we are many times on the meeting and webinar. So to, to me, very, uh, meaningful in this today webinar in a rule-based order this issue to me also very important is a thing but i'm is a i'm is a i'm literally i'm more in the research is uh, shino and china russia relation and shino china in the eurasia this in the um, uh, uh research this in the webinar then but i think uh, interesting is uh, you know today is uh, president uh, xi jinping he stress to lead to build a new beautiful the international order visit to in Vietnam, visit to state to Vietnam. So I'm very, today this uh, news is to me very interesting because in the, in over the 14 years in the China has a, a civil economic develop in the by a center in US international rule-based order. But now China, they is, uh, strategic is a change they came more in the in the economic security cooperation to russia in it because they also now expand the global south influence you know in the middle east africa uh, south america now china is more and more is uh, influence his power so so I, my is a more today many in the export to talking to how about on the good is a rule based order but more important thing is uh, now how about in the western country in the indian pacific more also south korea also usa or sweden many western country how about engage in the global south i think it look like is a very important thing because now in china and russia he's uh, expanded his uh, global south and BRICS. he built in new new in the um, beautiful the international order. I, I think is a, this is not or more and more his uh, influence is, uh, is expand his uh, power. And then we more thinking about is many now global south is not different in the Cold War era. Many in the global south countries, they are more value in national economic interest. This is, I think is very, we are most thinking about this thing. In a, before time, many, uh, country, they are very focused talking to uh, political ideology or democracy. But now many countries is not. They they is thinking change. They are more important in the 
economic interest. So why now China they and the engaging in the global south and bridge? I so this is a more different in the first in the world. So so I so my is a more thinking. My is a caption is also we so we in the Indian Pacific a lot country they also more credit to and the bold policy promotion need to establish a new in the relation to in the with the global south. So I this is my <laughs> comment. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Frida, do you or General Ingman have any comments? Yes, thank you. So I will also be very, very brief in my comment. Thank you so much for all your insightful um, presentations and valuable contribution. It's a very timely discussion. Uh, very, very happy to have listened into this webinar. So I think Gunnar's presentation really shows the need to work together uh, in the democratic community on these issues, while Songwon and Barbara's presentation both show that there is a wide diversity of both interpretations of, of um, uh, what the rules-based order and like-mindedness is, and then coupled with a diverse variety of values and interests, and then with uh, President Lee's comment about the trend of backsliding also in democratic countries. Um, my question is really, um, would ad hoc coalitions and informal corporations unilateralism in this region benefit from institutionalization uh, to both lock in democratic values against the backdrop of democratic backsliding um, and also to make clear uh, perhaps to multiple partners what, what the purpose is of, of the cooperation? Thank you. So I'm going to let uh, all of you have a, a quick comment. Um... And I, you know, my, we're running over time, but it's your time, so I'm gonna let you speak. <laughs> so, Gunnar, and then uh, Songwon, and then Barbara for to wrap everything up and explain for us what to do. So, Th Gunnar. thank you. Th thank you very much, and I will be very short because I, I need to run in order to open another seminar here in Stockholm. But, but I, I would like to say one thing that I think is so very important: we need to have more self confidence in democracies and the achievements of democracies. We are, if you look at the population, maybe not the biggest, but regarding economy and prosperity, democracy and market economies has proved its success. Uh, and that is in some way the most important tool for the future. Uh, and I don't think we shall be so captured by the different regional clusters we are talking about because they're creating a uh, paradigm on, on its own. The Global South is, of course, very much the leaders of the Global South. They want to be connected with each other. But that doesn't mean that the people in these countries have the same interest in upholding their autocracies. We should open up and secure that the people and the economies in this part of the world, as well as in other parts of the world, can connect and, and by that free up a societal development. But, but we can do that first if we have the self-confidence in what we have achieved and making democracies stronger versus the autocracies in our minds, but also in, in policies. May I thank you very much for this opportunity. And it has given me a lot of thoughts that we need to elaborate with further. But, but, but you. I, thank you, Gunnar. I need to say goodbye. Yeah, thank you, Gunnar, for your participation. It's always fantastic, as always. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Someone, you okay. put up your slides, so I... Yeah, yeah, because I, I see the question from Paul is that uh, is the decline of liberal international order coinciding with the decline of American hegemony in the world? And I, I think it's a very interesting question. And I'd like to share this slide because considering the increasing trends of like shifting towards autocracy and authoritarianism in Asia, I believe that decline in the influence of the United States is undoubtedly connected to the erosion of liberal international order in, in some ways in the, in, in the region. So as they feel more vulnerable to declining influence of the US and the, at the same time, growth of China's influence over time. So when you look at these um, graph like Asian experts tend to take um, re relative decline of a U.S. leadership more seriously than other um, experts in, in different regions, and they think that these are the these is the 
um, main driver of like a global challenges and crisis we face in, in the region. And regarding the um, three those questions, uh, yeah, institutionalizations of democratic values and and these like um, cohort and uh, mini laterals is important, but. The reason I'm showing this slide is that we have to focus on the regional like threats and the regional partnership. So um, can be especially effective addressing regional challenges and related to the democratic backsliding. So, but we don't have to like stick into the like a broader like ideological like block um, based uh, competitions. But we have to focus on the like practical and immediate threats that um, countries in the region face. And we have to support them and we have to create uh, some unilateral coalitions and partnership with them. Um, we have to uh, make them believe that these kind of regional initiatives can make help to solving the problem in real world. So I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So again, just very quickly, um, I agree with a lot of what has been said. We are seeing a very large resilience of, of democracy. You, Nicholas, mentioned, and I think I also did, the way that we have now a kind of a resurgence or reaffirmation of democracy in Poland after a government that has been sliding very much towards uh, an illiberal democracy. But that's not always the case. And that's kind of what, what worries me in terms of this rule-based order, because as Professor Chung has said, there is a retreat. Even democratic states, states that have been historically democratic, they have been backsliding in a lot of ways. Um, and again, this goes back to the some of the values that states have that while they might value democracy, some other value might be much higher, and I think this is very prevalent, especially in post-Soviet area, where sometimes security would be valued more highly than, um, than democracy. And it's similar in a lot of ways in those non-democratic states in, uh, in Indo-Pacific, where they value security, uh, territorial integrity more highly. And uh, kind of to 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 uh, a lot of the points that have been made earlier, if we want to convince people that the rules based order is the one to go with, it there has to be a conviction that democracy will make sure will ensure that these other interests are also met. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I do apologize for my inability to moderate such a fantastic discussion. We have so many very important inputs, but I think this points to one thing. We need a, actually a, a physical event. We need more time for discussion. We need to be able to elaborate on this much more. And, um, and I think, again, as I mentioned before, the, the strength of democracies and liberal societies is the ability to have these discussions, to criticize our own systems, and find new ways. I mean, democracy is not perfect. It's just the best system available. <laughs> but it's absolutely Im imperfect. And um, But we need to continuously improve it. Uh, and I, I think this is important. So more time for discussion. And we need to start looking at ways forward. Uh, and hopefully we will be able to meet each other in person and discuss this more in detail. Sang Hyung Lee, any final words before we shut down? Well, thank you very much. Uh, today's webinar was quite interesting. Uh, it's a, a little bit unusual topic, but anyhow, it was quite uh, useful and uh, exciting. Uh, once again, thank you for uh, joining today's webinar uh, as a panelist and uh, uh, listeners. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, and uh, have a wonderful uh, Christmas, all of you. Merry Christmas. Hey, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.